Well, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, welcome to today's media briefing. Uh, I'm Dr Ashley Bloomfield and I've got Commissioner Mike Bush here with me today. So today there are 76 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in New Zealand. Uh, one of our formerly probable cases has now been confirmed as having COVID-19 and is therefore one of those new 76 confirmed cases. There have been no other probable cases reported today. And so you will see that the number of probable cases has actually dropped by 1 to 37. There have been no additional COVID-19 deaths. And 63 people have recovered from COVID-19. So, in summary, the combined total of confirmed and probable cases in New Zealand today is 589, 75 more than yesterday. Today, we have 12 people in hospital with COVID-19 infection, and uh, it, is, it is good news that three of these people are expected to be discharged soon. Uh, there are people currently in Gisborne Hospital, Waikato Hospital, Whangarei Hospital, Dunedin Hospital, Auckland Hospital, Nelson Hospital, Waido Hospital in Blenheim, Taranaki Base Hospital. Each of those hospitals has one person, and Wellington Hospital, which has four. Two of the current inpatients are in intensive care, and for privacy reasons, we won't be providing other details on these patients. Uh, our laboratories around the country continue to process and report test results quickly, and over the last seven days, the average daily test number is 1,728. And just a reminder, anyone who has been tested is expected to be in strict self-isolation until they have that test result back. We are still seeing a strong link to overseas travel, as well as links to confirmed cases. And I just have some uh, information that I've just received. On the 455 cases where we have sufficient information presently, 57% of those uh, have a direct uh, link to overseas travel. 26% are close contacts of existing cases. 15% uh, have both overseas travel and or close contacts. Uh, and just 2% are currently community transmission. That's around 10 cases that we know are definitely community transmission. I'd like to shift to talk a little bit about flu vaccination. Uh, flu vaccination is going to be a very important part of our overall approach to COVID-19 because if we vaccinate people, then we can reduce pressure on our hospital system, particularly through winter. It's very important that the people who are eligible for free flu vaccination are prioritised for vaccination. So that is people over 65, people with pre-existing uh, medical conditions, uh, pregnant women and children with a history of a respiratory illness, as well as our frontline health and other frontline workers. For people who are not in those groups, who might usually get a flu vaccination each year, please wait. We are prioritising our resources to vaccinate those high priority groups. We want to keep our frontline workers well so that they can support our COVID-19 response. We want our people who are most likely to get complications from influenza if they get it, and therefore end up in hospital, to be vaccinated first. We will not be, or you should not be seeking a vaccination or expect to be called for a vaccination if you're not in one of those groups until at least mid-April. This is an important part of our overall response. There is plenty of vaccine. We have 400,000 more vaccines this year than we had last year, that's a 30% increase, and already 800,000 have been distributed. There are stories of some practices who have run short, and so we are working right across the country to redistribute the existing vaccine that is already in the system so that all practices who need it are able to vaccinate those high priority groups. And a final word on our surveillance for COVID-19. There is an existing online, in fact, uh, it's a, a, an email that you get each week called Flu Tracker. It asks about whether you've had symptoms of a fever or cough in the last week. We have now extended the questions on that Flu Tracker to include whether or not you've had a swab uh, or, or a test for COVID-19. And we, I would encourage everybody 
to uh, help contribute to our tracking of COVID-19 by registering online on the Flu Tracker uh, survey. Uh, the website will be on our media release, but just quickly, www.info.flutracking.net. This is a practical way that uh, we can all contribute to the monitoring of influenza-like symptoms and specifically to COVID-19 across New Zealand. Michael, I'll hand over to you. Kia ora, Ash. Kia ora, Koto. Fana. Three things I'd like to cover off today. The first one is in relation a general uh, briefing on compliance. Secondly is the impact on policing nationally. And third thing is to talk about uh, how we're going with the returning New Zealanders. First off, in terms of uh, how New Zealanders are complying with us, the vast majority of Kiwis of people inside New Zealand are complying brilliantly uh, and I want to acknowledge and thank them uh, for doing that. They know that to stay home saves lives. At the same time, those people who are complying are very passionate to ensure that others comply. Uh, to that end, as you know, we stood up a uh, online uh, facility, 105 at police.govt.nz at one o'clock yesterday. Since that was stood up, uh, we've had 4,200 reports of people believing others weren't complying. Again, it shows how determined Kiwis are to ensure that everyone complies with us. We crashed that system, we've put it back up again, it, uh, it's working. Uh, but again, I, I just want to say that everyone needs to comply in this realm. We have, for example, tourists who think it's okay to drive around the country in their camper vans. It's not okay. Stay absolutely put. Stay in place. We have, over the last few days, had cause to arrest three people uh, for persistent breaches. Uh, now, two of those people uh, were taken into police custody, uh, but later Release without charge, one person remains in police custody, uh, mainly because they had other outstanding matters in front of them. But again, we will be out there ensuring people do comply, because we can't say it enough, stay home saves lives. I also want to talk about uh, how things are impacting on policing in general. A few days ago we talked about the anticipated rise in family violence, family harm offences. Initially we did see a small rise, but uh, it's pleasing to see that in the last few days uh, that's been reversed and we've had a very slight reduction in family violence, family harm reports. I think that goes to the fact that people really do want to respect each other inside the home and know how challenging this will be for everyone. But of course we've got to stay the course on that. Um, we've seen a massive decline in public place violence as you would expect. We've seen a significant decline in the, in the number of people being arrested and placed into police custody generally. All positive things which enable us uh, to redeploy into those other priority areas um, which include ensuring that people re um, comply with uh, the COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, I can report um, that we have uh, two of our own staff that have tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, they are at home, uh, taking every precaution, obviously. Uh, they're not hospitalised uh, and we're putting every piece of uh, support we can around them. I'd also like to report, Ashley, you'll be interested in this. You may know that uh, last week uh, we graduated the Ashley Bloomfield Recruit Wing, 59 staff. Uh, today, all 59 of them have deployed and are out there on the streets of New Zealand doing everything they can to keep New Zealand safe. Well done on that, Ash. Thanks, Mike. Um, finally, I'd like to talk about the number of new, uh, returning New Zealanders. Uh, since uh, over the last three days, we've had 4,547 Kiwis return. As you know, we have a process in place, an end-to-end -end process uh, to assess them and uh, then ensure that they are compliant. 94 of those people were symptomatic and are in quarantine. 
1,200 of those persons uh, did not have a satisfactory uh, self-isolation plan, so they are in managed self-isolation. About 3,200 uh, did have a plan and they are self-isolating um, but are, we are sure, complying with that, although we will ensure that we have a process to visit those people or to ensure that they are complying with those restrictions. So that's all I have to update at the moment, other than to say and acknowledge those essential workers that they're out there uh, keeping the country going, keeping the country safe, they're doing a wonderful job uh, and they should be acknowledged for that. Kia ora. Can you give us some more details about the three people that were arrested? What were they doing? Were they just out and about when they shouldn't have been? Yeah, they were out and about. Uh, they'd come to our notice before. As per our four-step plan, they'd been previously warned about their behaviour. They decided that they wouldn't oblige, uh, so we obliged for them. They were take, Two of them were taken into custody. Uh, they stayed there for a short time. Uh, and then they were released without uh, prosecution. What about those two police who have tested positive? How mm. many of the, the police force are now in self-isolation because of those two cases? Uh, they're quite different cases. Uh, the first case, uh, uh, I have some detail around, um, that was uh, uh, contacted via um, a police role. So there were a number of people that they have been in contact with, so we're doing contact tracing and self-isolation in terms of that. Uh, I can't give you too much detail in terms of the second case other than to say that we have several hundred police officers across the country self-isolating as a precaution and a response to that and other things. The fact that they contracted COVID-19, does that suggest that police don't have adequate PPE gear when they're dealing with the public? Uh, this, this was quite earlier on, but we are building our stocks of PPA with PPE, we're taking a uh, our normal risk-based approach to that, but at the same time it's important that we get sufficient PPE to them and that's been a work in progress uh, over the last week. And even though um, you say most people are complying, just looking around the areas like Oriental Parade yesterday, there were hundreds if not thousands of people still out there, probably all within the rules, just exercising and mm. doing what they're allowed in their local mm. area. But is there a, a more firm instruction you can give people around congregating? So if you see someone down there, should you actually just go home if there are too many people in the space? You yeah, know, it's a very good point. I, I too uh, drove past Oriental Parade last night and it did surprise me how many people were out and about. Yes, it's within the rules, but I observed a number of people that weren't keeping their social distance. Obviously, some were still in their bubble, but um, it was obvious to me that some weren't and the social distancing was not being adhered to. I think that's something we really need to consider. And, I, and, and I'll take this opportunity to appeal to people. Again, you must stay local. That doesn't mean wandering off uh, five or six miles. It's stay in your neighbourhood, stay close to home, and really keep that social distancing. I, I think if people aren't complying, we're going to have to revisit this. So, yeah, so shouldn't your force actually be doing more to disperse those groups of people if they come Yes, absolutely. So that's that's what we're considering. As you know, the sun came out in Wellington at about 4 p.m. and uh, everyone took advantage of that. I really counsel against that. And again, you know, if you're out there and you're seeing a lot of other people out there, you must keep your distance, but stay local, stay close to home. What Thank you for raising that. What action have police taken as a direct result of those 4,200 or so reports to the 10th or so? Yeah, so a lot of them are general. What I can tell you is about a thousand of them relate to business and the rest relate to people. So for example, um, some of those um, reports are quite general. There are people congregating at Mairangi Beach that shouldn't be. So we'll deploy into that as a, as a tasker. Um, some of them aren't specific enough. So some of the reports are so-and-so's at the beach, or there are people at the beach, we don't know which beach. But we'll prioritise those and we will task our staff accordingly. Um, we've seen, um, you mentioned yourself that there are the tourists driving around in camper vans and we've seen a party of backpackers down in Queenstown. Mm. Are there any sort of specific um, punishments or anything that you could do for people on tourist visas who may not be adhering to the rules? Yeah, that, that is a, a matter we could look at with immigration as to whether or not, but I think that's, uh, I think we're better to give advice 
and actually get out there and intervene and educate those people in the first instance. But people who are tourists must know that they cannot drive around the country from destination to destination. I had it uh, recounted to me a few days ago, someone traveling um, from Tauranga for work purposes, you know, they couldn't move on the desert road for camper vans. That's got to stop. We will be out there. Uh, we will be educating in the first instance. But I appeal to those tourists, stay where you are. That's the rules. What and what would happen to them? Is, are we looking at a fine? Are they being forced into quarantine? Well, you know, if, if they are persistent, repeated um, breaches, uh, yeah, we'll take action against them, absolutely, as we did with the uh, three people I talked about. Can you give us some detail on these? Uh, checkpoints that are being set up, how many are there, what are you sort of looking for? You know, checkpoints at this point um, aren't part of our deployment model. We, we see them occurring um, and we will give consideration to whether or not they're necessary, but at the moment we're more mobile in terms of our interventions. What, what would you need to see before you start setting them up? I think there's, uh, so we're working with a lot of local communities, uh, as you would have seen um, through your media uh, a lot of people want to set up checkpoints and keep people out of their places, out of their areas, out of their towns. We want to work with them to make sure that's absolutely lawful. Dr. 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 Can I just ask, um, is there community transmission in Matamata? Uh, we know there's a cluster in Matamata, uh, and we know that there was an index case that was associated with overseas travel. Uh, what's not clear is the extent to which there might be community transmission. So we're doing a full investigation of that cluster at the moment. So how many people have tested positive within that cluster? Uh, as of yesterday there were nine and they were expecting uh, another few, so somewhere between 11 and 13, but we'll have the updated numbers on our website for that cluster after this briefing. Can you give us any more details about that? Was it linked to a specific business or how did that, how did that work? Well, I think there's been uh, social media postings linking it to a specific um, establishment and uh, associated with a St. Patrick's Day celebration. The Southern DHB last week said it was still seeking 257 contacts from the World Hereford Conference. Um, how many contacts are yet to be traced from confirmed cases and what does that mean in terms of a potential backlog? You know, we're going back weeks now in terms of trying to trace down, track down all those potential contacts. So uh, what I can say is that there's uh, much greater capacity now to do that contact tracing uh, and it's always work in progress. Uh, for example, sometimes it takes six or seven phone calls to see if uh, somebody can be contacted. If they can't be, then we work with other organisations, including the police, potentially to go and visit that address. Uh, so it depends on the number of contacts associated with each, um, with each case. Uh, right now we've got around 100 people now working in our National Contact Centre and that number is increasing daily uh, but so far we have every contact that we have been notified at least up until the last two days has been followed up at least with one phone call. Following, your, following the first death on um, the west coast yesterday, are hospitals changing the way that they treat anyone with flu-like symptoms? Yes, so uh, the case on the west coast was someone who presented with where COVID-19 wasn't part of what we'd call the differential diagnosis when they came in. So there were, there were good precautions taken for if that person had had influenza. Uh, now we have suggested to district health boards, and in fact there is a common approach to this, is anyone coming into ED who has what we would call a lower respiratory tract inf infection, so cough, fever, um, whether that's pneumonia or bronchitis, is being treated as if they are COVID-19 until proven otherwise, and therefore the appropriate measures taken in terms of personal protection. How many cases fall into that? Um, there was an update to the to the website yesterday on who, who was eligible, but there are still people like pharmacists and carers who have come to us saying they don't feel safe and they feel like they might pass it on. What's your advice to those people? Well, PPE is one part of keeping safe uh, in terms of keeping yourself safe from infection and of course uh, preventing passing on an infection. In the latter case, anyone who has symptoms shouldn't be at work or out of the house. Uh, if they're, uh, in, you know, they shouldn't be going out to the shop or doing anything. In the former instance, uh, we, we, you can see in supermarkets and a whole range of places that uh, they have put in distancing uh, uh, measures to make sure that, that uh, social distancing is maintained. Masks can have a role, and one thing we are doing is making sure that all our frontline workforces, who we wouldn't usually be providing masks to, 
do have some masks and that will include pharmacies, midwives and others. So we're, we're making a particular effort to ensure they have masks should they need to wear them. Uh, and hand washing, of course, is a major, still a major part of uh, keeping oneself safe. What about home support workers? Will you provide them masks? Because they're really worried that they're heading yep. into a lot of elderly people's homes and the risk of, of transmissions if they were to come into contact with it. Yes, I think that's, uh, that, that's a really vulnerable group, uh, the, the people who they're looking after. So the advice does cover, uh, that is on our website, covers home community support workers and the sorts of situations where they do or don't need to use protective equipment. I'm also aware that, as you've said, some people feel that wearing a mask <clears throat> is going to help protect them and will also protect the people they're looking after. So we're going to make a particular effort to ensure that our home and community support care uh, workers have got, through their organisations, access to masks. But if they need to use them, then yeah. they've got them. Yeah, and what about, um, we've been contacted by people that have donated blood and they're concerned that the people that are taking the blood aren't wearing enough your advice to the blood service? Well those are health workers and they'll be guided by the advice that's there. Not everyone in contact with someone in a healthcare setting needs to wear personal protective equipment. The majority of care will be of people will be in situations where people haven't got a respiratory illness or any symptoms and uh, don't have any risk of having it and so they would just take the normal precautions they would when they were taking blood or in any other setting. The, 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 the PPE guidelines that were the PPE guidelines for home care workers that were put online last week, they're no longer accessible. They've been taken down off the Ministry of Health website. Do you know why that is? Was there an issue with what was in there or not that I'm aware of. I didn't know they'd been taken down. I've got a, a hard copy. I think they've they're very good, so I'll check that when I get back just to make sure they are available. Well, can can you know, what planning are you putting in place? for um, widespread coronavirus in the police force. Does the, do these two positive tests make you feel nervous? Yeah, we are always very concerned about our staff. Ever since we kicked this off, we've been working, uh, like every other government agency and essential workforce is, around uh, building a contingency. Uh, so we have a contingency plan in place. We're even looking as far and wide as, uh, you know, what's happening inside the NYPD and taking learnings from other other organisations, but I can assure you that uh, Deputy uh, Chief Executive of People is leading our contingency planning around our own workforce. Yes. Speaking, speaking of, speaking of, speaking of, speaking of uh, New York, just, uh, uh, can, I, can I go over here? Because we haven't been uh, over there. There's been concern about Gloria Vale residents not adhering to the restrictions. What are the police doing to ensure that Gloria Vale residents are complying with those self isolation? Yeah, I can't give you the absolute detail. I'm aware that it's been in the media today and our local police are uh, examining how they approach that. Can I get back to you on that for further detail? No, sure. Commissioner. New York. So the, uh, are either of those two cases that you've identified within the police force, were either of them linked to a trip to New York and are there any other police officers who are being tested as a result? No, the first one, uh, the one I have more detail on was local uh, in terms of uh, what that officer was doing as part of uh, her role. And the, and the other case? I can't give you the detail, but I do not believe so. But allow me to... Um, Confirm. Are you testing to ensure there's not a cluster there, or are you testing? Yeah, no, they're quite separate. Yeah, very just separate. On, just on the 700 police officers who are self-isolating, how many of them have been tested? Uh, I can't give you that information. Uh, it's more precautionary, and they I don't believe any of them are symptomatic. Can you be more specific about separate than several hundred? Can you give us any numbers? Or yes, I think I can. I, look, please don't quote me. I think it's 380, but uh, the reason I'm not being specific is because I don't have that right in front of me. Commissioner, do you believe that supermarkets are breaking the law at the moment with regard to price gouging? Oh, I think uh, you'd need to be more specific, and I do know that others will talk to that point today. Commissioner, have you seen the reports of a kayaker having been rescued or left or and what's the advice being on it? Yes, I have seen that report, and again, it's not in line with the advice or uh, the compliance advice that we've given. So it's a really good example of the fact that if you're going to do this, you're putting others in jeopardy and causing others to come to your rescue. So we more than strongly advise against that kind of behaviour. Does, Does that apply to paddle waters as well? Yes. And the backpack party in Queenstown, what details can you give us about that and how you dealt with it? Yes, our staff responded to that. Uh, you know, uh, because it's in the reporting, uh, that they decided that was their own um, self-isolation bubble. That's 
very poor advice. They've been uh, strongly advised to break into much smaller groups and uh, under my definition that's a mass gathering and they should cease. Does the business that sort of facilitates the opportunities for people to breach these self-isolation, could they face punishment as well? Uh, I believe so, absolutely. Yeah, question. yes. Short answer is yes. There are reports um, that the, the woman on the west coast was not given a ventilator, uh, a respirator, sorry, um, a ventilator, and that, um, that she had no connection to international travel or anything else. What, what information do you have about, about those two details? So I'm just going to make a general co comment about the use of ventilators. Uh, the west coast uh, hospital, or Grey Base Hospital, can ventilate people if needs be. But as with uh, generally in any illness, the decision to, on whether to ventilate someone or not is a clinical and family decision. Uh, and that will be the case as we go through this uh, COVID-19 experience. Uh, it's, there's nothing unusual about that. So not every person who gets COVID-19 who may then uh, be on a palliative pathway will be ventilated. All our hospitals have the capacity to ventilate people if they need to be ventilated. And the, the fact that there was no sort of obvious connection to international travel or anything there, is this another community outbreak cluster or...? It, when I last saw and, and sought information, there were a couple of leads being uh, uh, followed up around a, a link to international travel still. Is there any advice that are in isolation, are they all still symptom free? That's my understanding, but if I find out anything different, I'll let you know. Is Commissioner, there any advice being developed for um, the likes of home care workers to develop work bubbles so so many people aren't going into so many homes or, or special rostering? Yes, actually I know that um, home and community support providers are looking at this so that they have uh, a small number of caregivers looking after the same people. Of course you can imagine if people require seven day a week care then they need to rotate and have rosters, that is for the staff, but that is absolutely an approach that I know is being used and I think it's a very good approach. And what about hospitals? What are they doing beyond cancelling elective surgeries, restricting visitors? What measures are they taking or could they take to stop any undetected spread? Well, I know that they've got measures at the front door to make sure that anyone coming in through the ED is being screened, first of all, to see if they're symptomatic. And if they're coming in for a respiratory type illness, they go down a different pathway. Of course, a key part of this is to make sure that anyone coming into the hospital, whether they're staff or visitors or couriers, so on, are not symptomatic. And that uh, we need to really keep our, our healthcare facilities COVID-19 free if we're going to protect them to, to be able to do the work they need to do. Should we take the last question down here, Ash? Sounds good. Commissioner, is it, is it fair to say that tourists are responsible for the majority of lockdown breaches? Uh, no, no, but uh, again, I strongly advise tourists uh, that they're not to move around the country, they're to stay in one location. Is there one particular group in society that's sort of been the least compliant? Uh, we haven't done the analytics on that yet, maybe, is it but coming? no, we don't have the answer to that. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you.